thank you very much for the introduction and I thanks again for the or, to the organizers of setting up this, for setting up this small workshop and inviting me to, to end the, the short time already so that's uh, very nice of you so um, I will talk about uh, the restricted isometry property as already mentioned and but uh, I will tell you what I mean by that but, uh, which is mainly this concept that appears in the theory of and it mentioned um, a couple of times in the side center but uh, I, not everybody will necessarily will be familiar with it so I will give a brief introduction which is very much biased into the problems in compressed sensing that I'm interested in. So I'm no, not attempting to make a complete overview. But then I will focus on frequency structured random matrices um, and uh, compressed sensing problems related to those, which uh, will then yield, lead to some chaos processes as we know. Before I conclude, I should mention that what I will be talking about is joint work with Shacha Mendelssohn at the Technion and with Holger Rahut, who is here, uh, the main organizer and one of the main organizers of the, of the trimester audience. So um, let me start by introducing something. I did forget something. <laughs> should, should, I, should I add a third, <laughs> third note of and in Aachen? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, you should get up. Okay. Compressed sensing. The uh, model assumption of what I will talk about is sparsity. So the idea is you look at these images and you make an appropriate basis expansion, then um, the signal, the image in this case, is an, an approximately sparse representation. So that is to say, in this basis, which in this case here is the high wavelet basis, you don't need to know what it is if you haven't heard this before. You just think some basis that is chosen in a way so that uh, we can well approximate the signal by restricting, setting all but very few basis coefficients to zero. So here you should think of S in this upper sum up there to be much larger, much smaller than the dimension. So you know that to exactly represent x, you need n coefficients, n basis elements. And here we're saying if we only have access to s of them, which we are free to choose, then we can already get quite good representation. The intuition behind this is that images have structures. We have limited information, but we don't know exactly where it's located. Or more specifically, we have a low, dimen low dimensionality, but a nonlinear structure. So, like we cannot just directly exploit this low dimension by uh, applying linear algebra techniques. So, in this example here, just to, to visualize it, we take this image first on the left as a complete image, and on the right, uh, setting everything to zero except the 10% largest coefficients and we can see that visually there's hardly any change. I'm claiming that hard wavelets are the best basis to choose. My claim is just that there are bases and of course you can invest a lot of work in uh, studying which bases are suitable for that but that should not be our main concern. Such a representation then we can do compressed sensing. The idea is that we have a, a measurement, a signal x. Now we have uh, visualized it to be sparse. So x means zero or approximately zero and colorful means, uh, colored means significant coefficient. And then we can say that we can uh, have this basis representation of our vector. Um, as a vector that has only very few non-zero entries and a lot of zeros. And then what we want to do is we want to make linear measurements to this vector and then get, a, get an outcome. The, uh, the hope is that this outcome y would incorporate 
some information on our vector x uh, or, or would allow us to recover our vector x even though it shouldn't because it's an underdetermined system and so it has many many solutions but what um, but we have this additional information of sparsity so even though there may be many solutions in total only the hope is that most of them are not sparse so we can discard them so just as a toy example we can I can to the talk that we've just heard about the full spark property so what, uh, Romanos was talking about was the fact that you can have a, if you have a 2k by 2k squared Gabo frame then uh, he showed that any any subset of 2k columns under certain assumptions is linearly independent so if we if that is the case then I'm claiming that the solution like in this example then they're claiming that the solution is the one with the smallest support just imagine there are two k sparse solution then obviously the difference is 2k sparse 2 times k sparse and on the other hand because the difference uh, it's the difference of two solutions the measurement of each solution is y so the measurement corresponding to the difference is zero y minus y so we have a vector in the kernel that has support size 2k and that is a contradiction to this assumption so basically what Romanus has shown us in the previous talk is that there are matrices and he, there are deterministic examples of matrices where um, you have such a property that even though there is of course no unique solution in total there is a unique k sparse solution still two problems are remaining as I have said this is a toy example uh, because of two reasons first of all I told you there is a unique solution but uh, that doesn't necessarily help us because we want to find that solution say uh, and that in general uh, if you don't have any additional assumptions is NP hard and the problem is that we have bad conditioning so the, the, a lot of these things I mean is it the same thing as what we have what we have what we what we can potentially have bad conditioning what Romanes was talking about all these determinants that are measures for invertibility of the matrix but it doesn't say anything of how stable it is actually to invert these matrices and let me just quickly review what conditioning conditioning is for more formally say the condition number would be is the maximum singular value of A and the minimum singular value so what does it mean to be well conditioned It means that the maximum close to the singular the uh, that this quantity is small, which the maximum and the minimum are close together. So that is I can write this down as min of A is approximately as max of A. Now uh, recall what this one way that you measure particular values would be um, the matrix so um, which so in, in some sense meaning that the greatest expansion is very close to the greatest compression so that is to say that AX is approximately constant in, in length 
for all x. So that is, in some sense, you can um, view this as the one way to uh, conditioning of a matrix or being well conditioned. Fine? Fine? What I'm, yes. And the idea is, of course, we can say, what is this constant? What are the, what constant one way? I mean, just if, if this includes all x, so one possible choice is to choose the vector that has only a single entry and otherwise zeros. And then this, this would be a double. This would be approximately one. Let me just move this up for matrices with normalized columns. Yeah, is that clear? So basically, if we, have, if we assume that our columns are normalized, then um, being well conditioned means that A applied to x is approximately 1 for every. So in some sense, that's what we would like here. But uh, we can't get this, because for the same reason as before, there are vectors for which this will not hold, neither the kernel of this matrix. And there's, there's no way that this rectangular matrix is well conditioned in the traditional sense. And now we're asking the question, so just asking, before that we said, when Romanus talked, we said a restriction to a, a submatrix of certain columns should be invertible. So in the same way, we are now asking a subset of, a restriction to a subset of a certain columns should be well conditioned. And that what this gives us, if we think about it in this way, is the so-called restricted isometry property. Uh, and if you look at this here, it's exactly what I've written down, just that we are restricting only to S sparse vectors X. S, you should think of being 2K, and just in the same as in the other example before, we always looked at the difference between two signals. So, and now we are restricting, just as before, we restricted to 2K columns and asked about invertibility. Now we are restricting to um, S columns and asking for being well conditioned. And that's, if you look, what I just wrote on the board, that's exactly this, except that this approximately 1, I specified to between 1 minus delta and 1 plus delta. So it's a really exactly saying a restriction to S columns is well conditioned. And once I define this, I, I um, can define, that I ask for which deltas. I want, want to quantify how good the conditioning is, and that's done by this constant delta, which I obviously want to choose as small as possible, because that gets me closer to being optimally conditioned. And then that's this restricted isometry constant delta. So this will be key to the talk, what's following. So is it, that idea clear? It's, it's, it's key or it's important, because I, I, I had two problems on the previous slide. One was how to solve the problem, and one was and I, I just addressed one, I addressed the conditioning problem. And for some strange reason, I also solved the other one sort of for free. Because once you have the restricted isometry property with a delta that is less than 1 over square root of 2, so it's not even that small, and there is a case for solution, then you can find it using convex optimization, minimization, for example. There's also other algorithms where the restricted isometry property works. Uh, total variation minimization, uh, iteratively reweighted least squares, greedy algorithms such as orthogonal matching pursuit, gradient projection methods. There's a very long list that could continue this. Um, the important thing is that uh, they all rely on this very same quantity where you can still say for all these algorithms, that's for one minimization taking the conditioning problem would also solve the, solve the sort of the efficient solvability issue. Well, 
nice, very, very, very nice to claim. So we have, uh, have defined a property and said if we have this property, then we can solve or we can find a solution and we don't have conditioning and problems and so on. That uh, alone, unfortunately, is only useful if we also have matrices that have this property. Because yeah, if not, then it's only meant for exercise. And I have to say already that it's very difficult. And that was already hinted at in the discussion after the last talk. Um, it's very difficult, I think, that with the sort of near optimal embedding dimensions that I will discuss, it, there's no deterministic constructions known, at least to my knowledge at this point. Um, and so what people do is they typically refer to random approaches. So the, let's try to make our matrix as random as, let's force, ignore everything you could potentially know from application. Let's make our matrix as random as possible. So the most random that we can think of are either, so, so have independent Gaussian random matrix entries, that would be one example, or just the entries to be chosen independently, uh, plus minus one with equal probability, or independently chosen uniformly on the uh, unit. But in any case, all entries have to be independent. And what all these distributions, these examples that I gave you have in common is that they are so-called sub-Gaussian distributions. That is, in some sense, if you look at the tail decay, the, the, the uh, an upper bound for the probability uh, of, the absolute, of the random variable being above a certain threshold t, then this decays um, below what you get for the Gaussian. So that's why they're called sub-Gaussian. And all these variables have this property. And so we can take such variables and populate a random matrix with it. So here, you every entry is chosen um, according to this distribution. And when you do that, then you can show that with very high probability, the resulting matrix has the restricted isometry property. There's this factor 1 over square root of m, basically because of what I've been showing on the blackboard. Because I said we have things, uh, we have all the singular values being close to 1, provided the columns are normalized. And this is that ensures these, these I think, of a plus minus 1 entries, for example, that are not normalized. M, they are, so there's hope at least you would get it correctly for uh, the one sparse vectors in them. Yeah. Oh, there he is. These are capital. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I, I may uh, switch, may have switched between capital and small n. Yes, I think there's no small n. There's n, n is n. There's just one n talk every capital and uh, uh, little n r of the same unit. <coughs> What's uh, remarkable about this result, that what you can show holds with high probability for such matrices, is that it's optimal up to constant. N you can show that an embedding dimension of um, s times log n over s, exactly what you get here up to this constant, also with the delta, is necessary to get the RIP at all. So what we we have a random projection, we basically show that basic that almost every matrix that you can think of, uh, like generic random matrix, behaves optimally in the sense of the restricted isometry property. And it's even stranger that, uh, given that basically every matrix works that you can think of, that it has not been possible yet to write down a single explicit example. Still, of course, basically every matrix works means that there are some that are excluded. Of course, you can also think easily think of examples w which don't have the RIP. For example, um, matrices with linear dependencies and stuff like that. Uh, so um, this may not be what enough for what you want in applications. So you want to impose additional structure. One way to think about this additional structure would be um, coming from certain applications. So if you're thinking of magnetic resonance imaging, our measurements are restricted to Fourier 
measurements. Also, I think at least, at least one first order model for MRI measurements would be in a product, would be uh, frequency measurements in rows of the discrete Fourier transform matrix. And um, so basically, when we're working with such an application, we're confounded by that. And that's certainly a, a very, very small set compared to all potential Gaussian matrices. So it, it's, there's nothing that prevents this from being exactly the excluded set. So we have to work for also for this specific application context to see that results generalize here. So that, and that has been done by Rudelson and Vershinin showing that um, you get something also, again, that's linear in S, but with some additional logarithmic factors. When you choose, uh, use the, your remaining degrees of freedom, basically, which rows of the Fourier transform you choose, again, at rank. The advantage is, uh, another advantage if just from the pure numerical point of view is that we have a fast matrix vector multiply via the fast Fourier transform, non equispace fast Fourier transform, and there is less randomness. One word that I should mention here, which is important, and we will completely neglect this for the rest of the talk, is I introduced sparsity to you. I said sparsity in a particular basis. And then I showed you this picture, which uh, was, was sort of the, the basis matrix was eaten up by the measurement matrix and sort of thought about uh, the standard basis in all cases. And that is um, not necessarily always, that can be an issue. And in this case, for example, it, it is an issue because um, here we just think that natural images may be sparse in a certain basis, but not in the same Like you think of pixel sparsity, that it's not, it won't be that most pixels of your image are zero. So you, we have this additional basis transform entering your image. So whatever this whatever you get here for the restricted isometry w may not work anymore if you work with the basis that you, that you have to consider in this application. So this is just a sort of a warning um, that also what I'm talking about for the rest of the talk is specific to the standard basis. And here in this case, we have, uh, we have worked on the topic uh, of overcoming these difficulties by using some variable density sampling schemes they basically, you don't choose all frequencies with the same probability at random, but with the white dots here are which frequencies you choose, and then you get a sort of bad reconstruction. And if you choose them using a structured distribution, then you get a better reconstruction. So that, that's, that's what we have for this example. But so th I should just, just put this as a warning so that for what I'm showing you in the remainder of the talk is all with respect to the standard basis and the, the application that requires a specific basis representation not necessarily trivial uh, to, to transfer the results to this set. So third example um, that I want to mention is random convolutions. So we one motivation, for example, is coded aperture imaging, where um, motivated by a pinhole image. And now you just have the idea of using multiple pinholes at the same time and get a superposition here. Um, in order to then uh, subsample on the imaging in the imaging domain that choosing the aperture pattern at random has been shown and what what you get is a subsampled random convolution so you take the, the convolution for simplicity sim cyclic mod n and then restrict but this time to a deterministic subset and again you can show that there you get the restricted isometry property with something linear when you choose this vector at random. Again, fast vector, vector multiply and efficient realization is a the filter. La the last example that I will present here is that of time frequency structured random matrices with R, which is the main focus of this. And it, it's motivated by wireless communication, where, where as we have already seen, has, has been discussed in, in multiple talks before. Like you can think of the time shifts being multipath propagation and then Doppler effect due to movements, frequency modulations. And then what you receive is a superposition of differently shifted and modulated copies. And only few of these 
and then, then sparsity enters the game. I think Peter has mentioned this yesterday, that he, he didn't really uh, talk about it much, but if you think of all the potential paths that your signal could take, where it could be reflected, only a few of them will actually happen. And so that's what you want to, that's where, com where sparsity enters the game, that's where the machinery is useful. And uh, the, the question then is to recover the channel parameters from a test input. Mm. And then the test input again can be chosen at random. The model what we get is this here. We have a translation operator that, I mean, this is just uh, what has been in, in a lot of the previous talks, translation and modulation. And then the model for the communication channel that we get is this one here. So um, the signal x, the, the sparse coefficient vector describing the channel that we want to recover is, is uh, sort of the coefficient that tells us how often the different combinations of modulations and translations of our signal. And then the goal is to recover x from a random vector. So let's be a little bit more precise here. Again, transla t translation m modulation. And then the matrix, we're setting it up as matrix, is this one. Think of this is what we are multiplying with our uh, channel parameter estimation vector x that we want to recover. So we have all the different potential modul combinations of modulations and translations of our random input epsilon here, then, and again, and then that's what we would apply to this uh, channel uh, coefficient vector. Yet epsilon, what we choose here is a random vector with independent L sub Gaussian entries of variance 1. So again, if you're not familiar with this notation, think of it being a standard normal uh, random vector or uh, a vector with that has plus minus 1 with equal probability in each component. Uh, because we are here in this time frequency setup, we will use double indices, which we denote by lambda, k, and l, and then uh, a pi of lambda to be this specific combination of m to the l and t to the k, and that lambda scalum of a is exactly 1 over square root of m times pi of lambda epsilon. Okay? So let's try to write out some things about the restricted isometry property. So here AX is what we want to calculate. Uh, so what, what enters the game, measurement of a, of a channel parameter vector. And uh, what this is, is um, basically the lambda entry of X multiplied by the lambda column of the matrix. We have noted that the lambda column is exactly or pi of lambda. Sorry, I'm this is changing. It should be pi of lambda times epsilon. But what we do is, I mean, this is exactly identically. We are rewriting it. Uh, the, the observation is it's also it's linear in x because it's a matrix applied to x, but it's also linear in epsilon. So we're just uh, rearranging things, uh, rearranging the order and changing the parentheses. So that's really nothing happened from here to here. And now we see that it's some matrix that depends on x applied to our, ma our vector epsilon, which is random. In order to analyze this, we first note, and, and this also is mentioned several times today, that these pi of lambda with the, this normalization 1 over square root of m forms an orthonormal basis of our, um, of our matrix say, space Cm times m. So if we, and x is the coefficient vector of, of our matrix Vx in that basis. So if we take this expectation here, first of all we note, we can just write this out and see that uh, epsilon i squared, uh, if epsilon i times epsilon j in expectation because we assumed independence is zero. So what's left is only the diagonal terms which, which gives us exactly the Frobenius norm squared. Or and then the Frobenius norm squared we're using this fact here that we are, uh, the x has coefficient x in this O and B representation. So um, the Frobenius norm is exactly the 
the norm of the vector of basis coefficients, which is the two norm of x, which is exactly x lambda, x in the two norm squared. So when we we can use this now to estimate the um, the restricted isometry constant. This is just writing the taking the definition from the previous slide and sort of rearranging it. We're taking the supremum over all sparse vectors on the sphere. Now we just introduce some normalization here. That's why we don't get the two norm of one, but we get the two norm of x, but we get one here because we assumed it to be on the sphere. This is what we want to calculate. For A x we just plug in V x epsilon and then from this here, we see that because we are on the sphere, this is 1. We can write 1 as the expectation of epsilon. So we get some random variable here of a specific form minus its expectation. So this is the quantity that we want to estimate here in this context. It's a special example of the so-called chaos process because if you think about this, here you can see that this actually cancels if in the Radermacher case the diagonal terms. So uh, what you get is really a, a, an expression of the form some vector epsilon times a matrix M times another vector epsilon, which has been termed a Radermacher chaos process. And when you take the suprema of such processes, which were in it the, and, and the result by Talagrand, this is work by Goetz and Holger and then you can see that you get a result like this here. So let one has to look at this because it has a slightly different form. That's ma mainly because um, than what we've seen in the previous examples, and this is mainly this uh, the setup is slightly different in the sense that we our matrix the, the main number of measurements is not free. We have uh, we have an m by m squared matrix. So it's like we could write our previous condition and get a condition m in terms of m, which would sort of be uh, not less interesting. And if we, uh, okay, I think I'm missing a fraction here. It should be m to the two thirds divided by log squared. Uh, matter, but in any case, uh, we had that the other things like m dependent linear on s up to logarithmic factors. And here we have it, it's it basically means it, it's not exactly linear dependence because we have respect to two thirds. So what we would expect and hope if we want to be in line with the other results that we have seen in the other examples, we would expect a power of one here and then potentially dividing by some logarithmic factors. So that's the the goal and, and my explanation and that may be just the uh, lay explanation because I know how I eventually solve how, 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 how we eventually solve the problem so it, uh, the, the, the quadratic structure is not taken into account here this M was an arbitrary matrix and we have used the bound for arbitrary matrices but because of we have this square here we have we know something we know much more on on this quantity and so that's why we want to study these um, positive definite rate Radermacher chaos process um, which have this specific form here, where we have really the square here. So we have some matrix. I mean, we had this this matrix. This was a specific class that was indexed sparse vector x. But let's forget this form for the moment. What exactly it is, but in general, just let's say we have the two norm of a epsilon squared minus the expectation, and this is the quantity that we want to want to analyze. And then when you, when you, to do this, it suffices to analyze the the or the moment. And then, so what I, the, the first step in this analysis is we have, what we want is the, the this to analyze this quantity wh which the deviation from this from its mean, but we start by looking at the random variable that doesn't have this expectation subtracted. So this is somewhat simpler it will will lead to a worse bound because this is of course expected to be close together but still we would l want to look at this simpler quantity first and then use it to refine later on 
um, let's take this quantity, this, this supremum of the uh, A epsilon by F A epsilon squared, and we can just write it out. Um, I'm, I should, should forgot to mention that what I would be most of be talking about is restricted to the uh, Rademacher case, the plus minus one case, because it's simpler in a certain respect, and then I will only a few words if time permits what we do in for more general uh, random variables. And here's already the case where it's simpler, because what makes it simpler is that the square of uh, plus minus one random variable is deterministically one. So that's why all the diagonal terms in this inner product here uh, don't, don't exhibit any randomness anymore, and then only randomness here is left. So that's why we can separate this deterministic part out, and this gives us the Frobenius norm of A. And I think it's a, we sh there needs to be a supremum here. Unfortunately, I forgot because the supremum here is inside. And, and then what we can do with this term is we can apply what we call what's, called what's called a decoupling result that, that says multiplicative constant. You can replace one of these vectors by an independent copy. So basically, we get this Frobenius norm and the same quantity as above here now with an epsilon and an independent copy of it. Yeah. Pardon? Yes. Oh, it's not a random variable. It's not a number. It's a random variable. So these. Exp the p norm is the expectation of p and then taken to the p through. Okay? So it's a, a yeah, probability measure. Of p norm. Yeah, it's a p moment of this, this random variable. And for this, uh, to estimate this thing here, we want to now apply what's called a chaining argument. So for that, we need to know an admissible sequence. So the idea is that we start with very few points. Let me just draw a quick picture. A quick point picture. And so the idea is we have spaces like we want to take, estimate the supremum over the space. So we start with a single point, then in the next step, establish the value of the random variable at the single point, and in the next step. But in order to, but we want to use the idea is if we have established our Linearity in the right sense, then we only need to look at the differences between the new points and the point that was established in the first step. That uh, is especially useful if you proceed and the number of points that you're considering at each step is growing dramatically. Then at each step you have many, many, many points uh, that you're adding. Here you can see it's 2 to the 2 to the r points. But on the other hand, because you already had very many on the previous step, there's always the distance. You, you always need to connect to the closest point, and these distances are very small. So you have very, very many, very small, con very, very small quantities, and that's why you still have a chance. And that's exactly what we do here. If we have this quantity, we somehow sum up over these, and you should think of exactly this pi r and pi r plus 1. Um, to be one of these steps. So it, you should think of there are many, many, many choices, but pi r plus 1 is always, is of, of all the many points, the, uh, the one that's closest to a point. So in some sense, the pi r plus 1 and pi r, when r is large, there's many, many options, but they are these two things are very, very close. So this is a very small thing. And in the beginning, there's fewer things, but then the distances are larger. This is one side, so we are do, doing a telescoping argument, but separately on both sides here on the left, 
of the inner product and then here on the right of the inner product and then we keep the other part of the inner product fixed. So that will, uh, Y will be become apparent on the next slide because we can apply Höfting's inequality and so what you think of is, is Höfting is here, so it's S backwards, you should think this quantity here by is just exactly the coefficient of our uh, vector epsilon that appears on this side here. So this is Höfting's inequality and then here there's just some uh, standard bound, bounding the two norm by the uh, operator norm times the two norm of the argument. The important thing is that we condition on the variable epsilon prime here. So we only consider randomness in one of the two variables for this particular expression. So why is this useful? What we get here is that this quantity here, pi r plus 1a, pi r plus 1a is just some matrix. You think, think of a sum a or some matrix b. So this is an expression of the quantity that we started with. So think of, we had the supremum of over the two norms, over all, all matrices a times epsilon. Um, this thing is certainly one matrix that qualifies. So we basically reduced it back to the quantity that we started with and we eventually wanted to estimate. So and that's why exactly what we get here is that this quantity of NA with a square is, is, is estimated by something where this NA appears again just by this term and then we have another factor here which is coming from um, adding up all these contributions of the very small elements. I think I don't have time to really go into detail here but what it leads to is a quantity that's a complexity parameter known in the theory of empirical processes which is the Talagrand gamma 2 function and that's defined like this and that you just uh, we said we had we said we choose two to the r, two to the r point somewhere such an admissible sequence and then the idea is that we want to do it in the optimal way that's why we take the experiments in the end over these uh, these admissible sequences. So how how do we get this? Is taking this this bounds for the probability. You see there's a two to the r from the fact that these things here are very very small, and then um, we are applying a union bound. We have many many things but then we have very small probabilities because of the 2 to the r and we can just add them up. Okay. So then this was to bound the first moment. I think um, to bound higher moments we just re take some tool that is known in the empirical process community closely related to concentration of measure and um, that bounds the pth moment of the quantity that we want to um, want to study by the first moment of the same thing with Gaussians and uh, then the pth moment but with the supremum outside. So here this both of them are this is what we just studied and this is considerably simpler because the supremum is outside of the expectation. Both can be taken care of and that gives us this result here which says has a, a bound for exactly these quantities here by the diameter in the Frobenius norm the gamma and the gamma 2 functional which is the bound for the first moment and also for the tail bounds of the probability. So why did I think I will skip the extensions to L sub Gaussian vectors and obtain the improved RIP estimate for time frequency and uh, uh, structured random matrices that are uh, a consequence of this result. So I, I decided to write it here in, in the form of M and M even though it's, it's a little bit implicit here. So the number of measurements that you need is linear in the sparsity with logarithmic factors that uh, allows you to a better comparison. So it's really along the lines of what we have seen in the other examples where we have uh, sparsity 
time, just times a number of log factors, and then we get the restricted isometry property. But we can, of course, also solve it for s, just bounding this by log m. m is always larger than s, so then we have m by log to the four m. So that's why it sort of really gets rid of this two two thirds that two we didn't like. Proof is uh, via what is called a Dudley integral. So that's some entropy bound to e um, to g estimate the gamma two functional. So to summarize, what we have shown you is a restricted isometry property for Timec uh, frequency structured matrices. Uh, we have uh, linear sparsity dependence up to logarithmic factors. And it only works for the standard basis. That's something that I should mention, because it's so. In, in some sense, it's a, I think it's an interesting open problem to see what happens when you have a basis that is not the standard basis. And that's certainly, um, if you want to apply this in practice, then there's no reason in, in the applications where you uh, where you have frequency representation. There's no reason to expect that you would get the standard basis. So that I think that's very interesting. Uh, thing to study here. And I thank you with that. I thank you for my attention. Not without mentioning again uh, that there's, I, I already mentioned it last week, that there will be a summer school. Uh, we haven't put up a website. I know people ask me for, for information we, on mathematical methods for high dimensional data analysis organized by Uli Bauer and myself at UN. Thank you. That's because we have if we do, if we want to solve this for s, then we have s and log s, and so the the stupid way of bounding this is just saying s is less than m, then we can put everything to the other side. But the, this is just to have something that was would be co would be comparable to the other result. But uh, yeah, I agree, it's crude. Which oh, the wind. The wind so the, I think the application. So I mean, we have to ask other people here in the audience uh, how close it is to how close it is to practical implementation. But the idea is that uh, you think of something uh, like calibration of a wireless channel. So uh, that you that you just you can send a test signal at your own discretion. And what you want to identify is the channel parameters that you can then use. Uh, once you identify the channel parameter, you can use it to, uh, to get the channel properties. And then when, when the actual call is coming in, uh, to, to, to be able to decipher. So you're saying how tight is the x how tight is this bound or how tight is the s by the So say you're losing a log factor. I mean you can't lose more than a log, log then at least you can't lose more than three log factors because we have one log factor needs to be there. But I think I think that pardon? Let me show you this chart. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, well, I think you, so you do around expected value, whatever it is, like it doesn't need to be x, it's just, uh, it's just that in this case here, this, well, we can estimate everything that's of this form, and what we have to show is that this is of this form. So that's why we have, this is one, and that's why th what this shows is that this one is this expected value. If this was a two here, then um, probably I would think that the best way we can estimate this is by one plus this. But I mean, if you are, I, I think that you expect the closest concentration with respect to the ex expected value. So if you didn't have the expected value here, but something else, then it would probably be the best to shave off the difference and using tri inequality and uh, yeah does this answer your question yeah kind of But, uh, but then this, this and you would also expect them to be a full spark. And I mean, so in some sense, the, you, it, knowing that some are not full spark is sort of, is, means that these examples are terribly conditioned. <laughs>
Yeah, but I think that these are these are somehow related, right? These are some chirps. These are chirps. I think so, right? So it's not that far. Yes, yes, but I mean that the 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 construction. I don't 